It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, get signed up for that. We have a sign-up sheet in the lobby so that we know who's coming um, and, and all of that. And so I'm really excited. I'm proud of our men's ministry for doing that because it's just going to be a really cool event. Um, I wish I could go. I'm actually not going to be able to make it to this event. Um, but it looks like a ton of fun. And especially if you like to shoot guns, if you like to eat barbecue. And I hope that you love the Bible. So... That hits a very, very wide range of people. So I hope that that is uh, something that you would like to sign up for. If you would like to, go ahead and sign up for that in that sign-up sheet out in the lobby. So last week, Ben did a great job answering our question from last week in Nehemiah chapter 7, which was, what do I count? Who counts? What counts? And so I thought that was a, a an interesting um, and great title for that message because that whole chapter was all full of numbers and names, numbers and names over and over and over again. So we've gone through the book of Nehemiah and we're past the point where they've built the, the, the walls back up. And they did this amazing thing in 52 days um, where they've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And so now he invites everybody out from the, the outskirts of the city, from the surrounding villages, everybody that's been involved in this, in this helping process. And he's brought them all into the city. And he comes to this, and I, I thought this was interesting. I was reading this in preparation for Nehemiah 8, which is where we are today. If you have brought your Bible, go ahead and turn there right now. Um, but I noticed this as, we were, as I was reading through Nehemiah 7 in preparation for Nehemiah 8. And I noticed that there were 42,360 people referenced to in the passage in Nehemiah chapter 7. These are families, these are people, these are people that are connected to those families, and that's minus the servants and the singers, and even then, minus all of the cattle and donkeys and all of this stuff. Nehemiah goes to great detail to make sure that we know how many people, how many things, how many objects, how many animals are present in this festival, this this celebration that's happening in Nehemiah 7. And why does he take so much time to detail every single person? We get the family names from all of these different groups taking up space in Nehemiah 7. Why does it do that? Because God doesn't do anything on accident. I think it's because God cares about each and every one of them specifically. And notice I said specifically. He cares enough about each and every one of them to write their names down, to take up space in what will become his holy word with each of these people's family names. That's the first uh, fill in the blank for you guys as well, because God cares about each and every one of them specifically. He cares about people like Parosh and Bebai. He cares about Pasher, about Jeshua. He cares about Elam and, and this guy named Zerubbabel, who's actually the king that leads them back first. He cares about every single one of his people that returned from the exile to help with the rebuilding process of Jerusalem. And I think that idea of care continues. What do I always teach you guys, if you've ever been in a class with me, that you should always read the chapters before and after what it is that you're reading. Because coming into Nehemiah chapter 8, I think we need to hold on to that idea because I think Nehemiah 7 is telling us a truth. He's saying over and over again that God loves his people, that God loves his people by name. He loves you specifically, and God knows what each and every one of his people need. So as we come into the text of Nehemiah chapter 8, we need to be aware of that, that God cares about each and every one of you who are part of his people today, and that love still applies to us. We can see this clearly in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. I'm not sure what translation I have in the back. Yeah, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Another verse is very similar to it, showing God's love for us, Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God loves his people. And with that in mind, I think that we should apply what God is about to do for those gathered in Jerusalem for our lives today. And so by the end of the message today, I want you guys to see three things kind of in this step. I want you to see that we need to hear, that we need to understand, and that we need to apply the word of God to our lives. And the question at the top of your outlines is, what do I need? And the answer right up front, this is going to spoil the whole sermon, is you need the word of God. 
And since we say we need the word, I hope you brought your Bibles. Um, so grab out your Bibles. You're either going to have paper Bibles on your chairs. You can read it off the screen. You can do it on your phones. I am not offended by any of those things. I'd love for you guys to be able to have that. This is a fairly short chapter, so we're going to read through 12 of the 18 verses, and we're going to talk about the last six. So let's pray that the Holy Spirit would inspire our reading of this text, and then we will begin to talk about it. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We praise you for who you are. Thank you for for giving us your son. Thank you for, for being part of our lives. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, as we come to study your, your text today, Lord, I just pray that you would open it up for us with your Holy Spirit. Show us what you want us to, to know. Show us what you want us to see. And Lord, give us the tools to do so carefully. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as you turn over to Nehemiah chapter 8, we're going to be starting out reading verses 1 through 7. And here we're going to see that we need to hear the word. And so you guys are going to hear the word just here in a second. Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 1 through 7. Remember, these are all the people that are, have been numbered. We know their names. We know their families. They've been throughout this book. It says in verse 1, All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. I wasn't planning on stopping here originally, um, but I I think there's two things that are really important here. Um, First is to notice who Ezra is. Um, You guys might open your Bibles and you'll hit Ezra before you hit Nehemiah. They're right next to each other. They actually used to be one book. Um, Ezra may have been the person that, that connected all of these and take, took the, the writings of Nehemiah and compiled them for him. And so he was a professional scribe. He would have known how to do that far better than a governor. And so he probably was the person that pulled these books together. And so Ezra and Nehemiah used to be read as one book. And Ezra is this, this great teacher. He's this great priest and he's this great scribe. And so what he's really good at is, is reading. He's really good at reading. He's really good at writing. He's really good at pulling together things. But what he's, what he's even better at is teaching the people how to do the same thing. And so when you, you read this name, Ezra, I want you to think about that, that he's involved in the story and he's going to come in. It's almost like a collaboration between Nehemiah and Ezra. Ezra just got called up on stage to kind of help with this part because this is what he specializes in. This is what he is good at. And so as we continue to read, if you want more backstory on the the guy Ezra, you can go and read his book. It's right before Nehemiah. Verse 2 says this, so on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. To his right stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masiah. To his left stood Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalem. That's a mouthful. Ezra stood on the platform in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen as they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I want to point out something here that I think is interesting. When the word of God is is opened and it's read, these people respond, both physically and emotionally. They stand up at the reading of the word of God. Some churches do that. We don't generally do that. But I think it's a great sign of respect for what God is doing in the text. What he's saying to us, the the fact that he is pouring out some revelation, some knowledge to us through his word. Another thing that I think is neat about this specific text is that it says that they they respond with, with amen, amen, which really means truly, truly. If you're reading from Jesus in John chapter 3, he uses this phrase over and over again, amen, amen. And that's the, the original. We just take that right and add it into English. But what it means is truly, truly. And he says it like he's talking to Nicodemus. He says, truly, truly, I say to you. Right? And he's making this statement that this is the truth. And it's not just true, but it's affecting you. It's something that you know is true, but you know it more than just up here. You know it in your heart. You know that this, that these facts, that this scripture is true. And that's what these people are seeing. And then 
Ezra does something different. Because he could have just read it, and they respond, and we just move on. But that'd be a really short passage. Then he says to the, then he has the Levites do something. And so the Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Masiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah. I read all these names for a reason. These are real people with real names who really matter because God cares about each and every one of these people. And I'm going to read their names, even if I butcher them. Then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. So this is something crazy. I think he'd be pretty mad at me if I got up here at 10, 15, and I started reading, and I read for six hours. Maybe a little bit. You guys seem more okay with that. Maybe we should do that next week. No, I should tell you we're doing that next week and see who shows up, right? Um, no, but it's so... Ezra gets up on this platform, this, this kind of really high pulpit, we can imagine, this wooden thing that they've erected in the middle of the city, and he begins to read, and he reads from the early morning till noon, and then he brings out the teachers. This is a long day, but these people don't even move. It says that while well, everyone remained in their places, and the Levites come out and they teach the people what Ezra has just read about. Now, I think this part can get a little complicated for us. Why did, the, why did the Levites have to come out? Isn't God's word clear enough for them? Well, for them, we have to understand something about language and about literacy rates. So today in the U.S., we have about a 79% adult literacy rate, which means that 79% of the people that you encounter as adults will be able to read and write proficiently in English, well enough to do business, well enough to, to, to communicate with other people, all of that stuff. The, the literacy rate for this group of Hebrew people at this time was probably somewhere around 3%. 3% of the people could do this. I wish I had a quicker math brain to do head math of what 42,360, 3% of that is. But it's a very, very small number. It's a very small percentage of the total population. So they couldn't read the word of God right? So it had to be read to them. They had to hear the Word of God. But, but it's really hard to study the Word of God if, if you can't read it. And so that's what Ezra does. He sends out teachers, and they go out and study the Word of God with these people. He realized that, that reading the Word alone is great. That's a great thing. And if that's your starting point today, start a Bible reading plan. Start to read. Just encounter the Scripture. But what's even better is to read and study the Word of God with the goal of understanding it. We need to read the Word. We also need to understand the Word. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, I think is so interesting. He says this, They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, Don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites too quieted the people, telling them, hush, don't weep, for this is a sacred day. And this is when it all dawns on them. They understand the text. What do they do? They said, so the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because they had heard God's words and understood them. One of the things that we're grateful to be able to do here at Homeport is to offer a, a pretty significant amount of classes. This has been something that we've been really trying to do over the last couple of years, and I'm really excited to say that now we have a bunch of classes. Um, and if you're not a part of one, I hope you would be, because reading the Word is really important, right? We should be in our Scriptures. We should be reading as much as we can of the Scripture. But I, but I would argue that understanding it is your, your, your next step. And so if you've been reading the Word of God for a long time, but you haven't been understanding it, I hope that you join us for classes. We have a Romans class happening right now. I think I have a slide for that. Yeah, look at my nice looking slides. Um, I'm terribly bad at art, so I just steal all of the designs off of Canva. So don't take my, you know, me as being some great artist. It's, that's what we have 
modern technology for. Um, and you can join us in that. We're 14 weeks into our study of Romans, but we have a break week coming up in two weeks. Come join us. We're going to do a recap that week. We're going to have some donuts. It's going to be awesome. Um, and so that, that class is going to go for 30 weeks. It's happening every Sunday out in the modular at 8.45 a.m. We're also having a Tuesday morning study meeting on First Peter, and we're meeting out there at 10 a.m. out in the modular. Come join us for that. That's a great short book, and if you miss that, then we'll move on to Second Peter. That's how that one's going. We're just going right through it, and it's been awesome. Um, it's been a great opportunity for, for those of you that meet at 10 a.m. And then we've got youth programs. We've got our, our stuff going through the life and teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, and this is our pre-K and kindergarten, kindergarten through fifth grade is all studying this as we're going through. And then we're also doing the book of Jonah, at, on Sunday nights, and all my youth group kids are very excited about that. We've learned a lot about fish and a lot about um, not getting swallowed by one, and so um, by David Platt. So we've been doing that for a while, and so these are all great opportunities for you guys to understand the Word of God, and I think we should all be a part of these kinds of groups, and we offer all of these because we believe something about the Word of God. There is an order to applying God's Word to your life. If you want to get to the application stage, you have to go through those first two stages. You need to read the Word of God. You need to hear the Word of God. You need to encounter it every day. But you also need to understand it. You need to study it. You need to dig into it. It needs to become part of your life. I laugh at how Bible study usually works. And if you've been in a Bible study, you kind of rec- you'd recognize this. You read a passage, right? You read the passage, and you're like, okay, this is great. You study the passage, you're like, oh, I'm smart. Now I'm starting to understand it. I've got, I've got an idea of what that word means. I looked up all the words in the dictionary. We'll get to that in a minute. And then you come up with this crazy idea that no one's ever thought of. And you say it to one of your friends. And they're like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What in the world are you talking about? That's not what that passage says at all. And so you argue about it, and you debate about it, and you talk about it, and, and you get closer to the, the original intent, and you, you study through different, different versions of your Bible. You study the original languages if you can, or if you have access to some of the software that you can get for that. You go through, and you watch teaching videos, and you listen to pastors and professors talk about it, and slowly over time, you, you get closer and closer until one day, the scripture that you're reading just opens up. And finally, you understand it, and then it naturally applies to your life. And that's what the people of Israel do here. You, we can see them understand the Word of God, but it, it has to be read to them and then explained to them, because otherwise they would have applied it with tears. And that's not what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to be grateful and glad and happy. And so the Levites help them see that. Their response, I don't think, is much different than ours. Sometimes we read Scripture and we get the wrong thing out of it because we haven't understood it. Sometimes we encounter Scripture and we're convicted, and we should be. Sometimes we read a passage detailing some of our own sins, and we should be convicted of those sins. But think about this, and I think this is what the Levites are telling the people. God wants to to talk to you. God wants to have a relationship with you, and the way that he does it is through his word. That's a a great blessing. That's a point of joy. Read your Bibles and get in groups to help you understand it. And then he does a step further, and this naturally happens when we understand this. God loves the people. He has a plan for them. That plan involves reading, understanding, and then finally applying God's word. Nehemiah chapter 8, 13 through 18, we won't read the entire thing, but what it's basically happening is they go home, they wake up the next morning, and they start to read the scriptures, and they realize something. They're supposed to be feasting. It's a feast day. If you go back, and it was the feast of booths, it was the festival of booths, which would commemorate their Um, they're sojourning through the wilderness. And so they don't have houses to live in. They just have tents. And so once a a year, the Jewish people are supposed to live in tents so that they would remember that time that they spent in the wilderness. They hadn't done this for 900 years. They've been skipping a yearly festival for 900 years because they didn't understand the passage, because they didn't read it. They didn't encounter the word of God given in the first five books of the Bible at this point. That's the, the, the danger we take when we don't try to read and understand the word. But what do they do? 
They're like, well, we need to apply this to our lives. And so they start right then having this festival again. And here we see the final goal of all Bible study is application. Applying the word of God to our lives every single day. Now, instead of doing this with Nehemiah, I was actually going to jump us forward a little bit. And so what I want to help you guys do as our application point today is to learn to apply Scripture. But we're going to follow the way of reading and understanding, and then that understanding leading to application in our lives. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 3. I'm going to take a little bit of my Romans class work out. And so Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Super short passage. We're going to read this. I'm actually going to read it. If you have the NLT, we're going to read it from the ESV. It will be up on the screen. The only reason I do that is this. Um, the, The words themselves become extremely important when you begin to study at a, at a deeper level than, than a whole chapter. So when you start getting into verses and, and individual words, I want something that is the closest to the original Greek. And one of the things that I've learned is I've taken about four years of, of Greek, which is a lot of Greek, and I'm still not very good at it. But one thing I've learned about this is that every time I go back through Bible translations, I hit some of these what are called word-for-word translations. And pro tip, if you ever take Greek, you can slightly cheat with an ESV or an NASB. That's a huge compliment to those two texts. Because what they're doing is they're trying to give you as close to the original language as it possibly can. Sometimes it's really hard to read because Greek makes a lot less sense to us. But that's what they're trying to do. And so I encourage you, if you're going to get really serious about studying, the NLT is trying to make it a little bit easier for you, and that's a good thing. We should read it. It's a great translation. But your English Standard Version or your NASB or a King James or a New King James, something like that is going to be a little bit closer in with those original Greek words. And I, I want us to be able to study deeply. And so that's, that's why we're going to read it. So it's going to be up on the screen as well in that English Standard Version text. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord, first of all, for that text. What an amazing, short, distilled form of the gospel that that is. You all have these papers sitting on your chairs. This is my, jokingly, 10 steps to understanding and applying scripture. So grab that sheet. We're going to go through this very quickly. Um, Some of these... We're going to do this quickly. I'm not going to show you every step of the studying process for all of these because it would take us like an hour and a half. It took me a long time to, to pull all these resources together. But I want you guys to do this if you get serious about understanding and applying God's word. These are all things that you can Google. These are all things that you can look up. These are all things that a study Bible will answer. And so I want us to, to get really good at this. First of all, we're going to pray. Now, we already prayed in the beginning of this message, but I hope that you would pray that God would open up the text for you because nothing happens apart from the Holy Spirit in our lives. So I hope that we would pray that God would give us an understanding of the Scripture. That is the the first step in any reading, in any understanding, in any applying process. Pray about the Scripture. The last one is, if you skip all the way down to 10, is... How does this passage apply to my life? Now, what happens if we skip some of these steps in the middle? We're going to apply things that we don't know if that's the right way to think about the passage. We will be crying rather than rejoicing. Do you see the importance of understanding this text well? And so we're going to ask a couple of questions. Who did God use to write this? We know that all scripture is is breathed out by God and he breathes this out and he uses human beings to write it. And who is this? Well, we can go back just a chapter in Romans to Romans 1.1 and see that it's the Apostle Paul. And it's, he's, he's this, if we learn more about him, you can go and find more about him in the book of Acts. He is this apostle who used to hate the church and persecute it, tried to murder it, but was, was dragged, essentially kicking and screaming, into Christianity by Christ on the road to Damascus to persecute and murder Christians. This is like the least likely guy made now one of the most prolific apostles. He writes most of the New Testament. When and where was this written and to whom? Sorry for the perfect English there. 
my, my mother put a lot of English into our early education. Um, when and where was this written and to whom, right? Who is this written to? Well, this is written from the city of Corinth, probably in 55 to 57 AD. Why is that important? Because it's really soon after Jesus dies and is raised to life. And well, the church is exploding in the world and it's, it's getting into cities and people are starting to recognize the gospel. And they need to be really clear about what that gospel is. It's also, it's written to Roman Christians. We see that in, in, Rome, uh, in Romans chapter 1 verse 7. He tells you who this is supposed to be written to. He says to the church in Rome... To, those, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And then he blesses them, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this stuff you find in the text. Then I want you guys to highlight some words. What words do you not know? Because that's going to be really important. It's really hard to understand a text if you don't understand the words. And so I want you to highlight some, some words here. And this is basic Bible stuff, but I hope this is, this is helpful. And so today I, I highlighted two of them, fall short and justified. Justified is a big word. We don't use it in any other part of our lives. And then fall short can kind of be a little weird. So fall short just means to miss, right? We missed the mark. You're shooting jump shots in, the, in the, the driveway. And if you're like me, you didn't hit any of them. And so you missed a lot of jump shots. You missed a lot of things that you tried for. And that's our entire life towards God. We are not righteous. We keep missing. We can't do anything right. And so that's missing the mark. But what's awesome is that God has a way around that. I almost imagine God doing it this way. He's like, okay, you're, you're, you're worse than a bad shot. You're a dead man. And a dead man's not going to play basketball, right? A dead man's not going to do anything. A dead man's laying on the floor, dead, right? Sorry for the morbid imagery. But what does God do? He makes us alive in Christ Jesus, so that we can actually start to shoot the ball, so that we might actually make something, right? And that's kind of the idea of justified. He declares us righteous before God, which is something that we could never have done otherwise because we were dead. We were dead in our sins, and we were wicked all the time, continually. Little word definitions help a lot. Um, the next one is what genre is this? I think some people like this question more than others. Um, if you're a big book person, you like a certain genre, right? Um, we all have different things. I, I really like, like a good sci-fi movie. I like a good action movie. I like it when those two things are combined. I'm a big Terminator fan. My mom loves that. Um, and the, but these, you would never watch a Terminator movie like you would watch a comedy. You'd never watch a horror movie like you would watch an action movie. Because you're expecting different things to happen, right? And that's how it is in the text, too. And so this is specifically an epistle, which means it's a letter. And he's writing it to someone with specific instructions. Also, what well, the nice thing about Romans is he's writing it with a purpose. He's never been there. He tells us he's never been to the city of Rome. No apostle has. And so what's the, what he, might he be doing when he sends them a letter? He wants to make sure they, they believe the right thing. He wants to make sure they understand the gospel. And so that's why throughout the book of Romans, he just goes over and over, annoyingly often, re-saying, restating the gospel so that it is, it is clear as day for people to understand. How does this passage make sense with the rest of Scripture? This one, you'd have to do a little work, so I'm not going to do all the work for you, but I'll give you one. Genesis chapter 3, the fall. All people, we fall in Adam. We're fallen people, and yet we have been brought back to life. And it was promised all the way back there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is, is, there's this big theological word. This is one of my favorites. If you ever break this out into Scrabble or a dinner table conversation. The proto-evangelium, right? The first evangelism, the first gospel is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God is cursing Eve. And he, she says, or is, is cursing the serpent, that, that his offspring will be crushed by the, the seed of the woman. Recognize that I didn't say man and woman. It's like he's prophesying the virgin birth of Christ already thousands and thousands of years before it actually takes place. You can find a lot more of those, but continue to look for those. If the, um, what did the author intend to communicate? Uh, what, what's around it? What's all the passage saying around it? Don't ever read just two verses. Read the whole thing. So if you read all of Romans 3 and really all of the book of Romans, he's saying, hey, your works don't matter. 
You could do the worst things in the world. You could be a murderer. He was. Or you could be a pretty good guy. And it doesn't matter. Because being a good guy isn't going to get you into heaven because you've already sinned. You're not that good. And if you're a murderer, you're still not that bad because Paul was a murderer. David was an adulterer and a murderer. And he still made it into heaven. Why? Because God, not because of him. And so he's going to just preach grace over and over and over again. If the passage is hard to understand, what other passages are clearer on the same topic? This one is pretty clear. It's saying here, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a basic statement, right? We have sinned and we fall short. We miss the mark. We can't make it on our own. That's not a fun verse. And then verse 24 is really great news. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are saved by grace by Christ, not through our own works. So how does this passage point out or glorify God? Notice I put Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in there. I like how you can apply it to all three of these. And so I think this is amazing to think about the Father sending the Son on our behalf. And the Son dying willingly on the cross and being raised to life for us. And the Holy Spirit affecting that salvation for each and every one of us and sealing us for the day that he comes back. Now we can apply the text, right? Now you can apply the text in a way that's meaningful. Now we can see that, that in the beginning of Nehemiah 7, we saw that, that God loves us specifically. He knows us by name. And what an encouragement that is as we came into Nehemiah 7. And then as we came into Nehemiah 8, we learned that, that we, those people should be reading and understanding and applying the word of God to their lives because it will change your life. It will apply to your life and you will be different than you were before. God knows you. He knows what you've done. He knows what you're doing and what you will do. He knows that you're a sinner who's missed far more shots than you've taken. And he could have let you die in your sins. And he should have let you die in your sins. But he's not going to. Instead, here's the understanding. God loves you specifically enough for God to die for your sins he did that for you you Christians stand justi justified by his grace as a gift because of what Jesus did for you now we've read the word of God right we've done quite a bit of reading this morning I think we've done some understanding I hope so and I want the word of God to apply it to your own life. And so my, my, my only application is this. Non-Christians, if you don't yet believe in Christ, you haven't committed your life to him, you haven't understood really this until today, this is a good message. Because you don't have to do anything to earn it. If you came in here worried about how you looked or how you felt or what you've done, then don't worry about it. Because these are worse people. And they got saved. Because grace is awesome. And if you're a Christian today, you're getting called out to get in your words. You all have a Bible. The, the Bible is the most printed book in the English language. Praise the Lord. Get one. If you don't have one, it's free on your phone or on your tablet, or on any device that you have. You can even listen to it on your TV. Get it. There's no excuse. Read it. But then don't stop with reading. Show up to classes. Understand something about the Word of God, because that's where it's going to come from to change your life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for just everything that you've done. Thank you for everything that you're doing here in this church, Lord, through your people. God, I pray that you would help us to apply the word of God. Help us to read the word of God. Help us to understand your word. God, help us to apply it. Lord, help us to see that your gospel is so easy and so simple. And Lord, the better we understand it, the more it just cuts us to our heart. 
Lord, and as your people did in, in Acts chapter 2, when, when Peter is preaching to them and, they, and he's preaching to them over and over again, he's saying, this is the gospel. And they say, what shall we do? It's right there in their response. Repent and be baptized. What a simple message. Just pray that you would be with them. Lord, be with all your people. Help them to see you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.